Hey Heartland, stoked to be with you guys today. My name's Scott Lasuk and I'm one of the pastors on staff here. And it's a new year, baby, 2021. And it seems like with the new year, we always tend to think in new beginnings, don't we? I've been thinking about some of the things I wanna change, some of my new year's resolutions, but it feels like a strange year to do that. It feels like with all this uncertainty, all these things that are changing around us all the time, is it really the year to do that? And I think it is. And I would encourage you guys, why don't we set some goals on things that can't be changed by isolation or separation? Why don't we set some goals to grow deeper with Christ, set some goals to read his word more, to really pursue that relationship which is always with you no matter where you're at. And I know one of the ways that I have grown so much with Christ, one of the most profound memories I have of encountering him was through communion. And we're actually gonna be taking communion together later in the service. So if you have any juice and bread on hand, or even if it's water and soda crackers, it doesn't matter. I would encourage you guys, if you wanna partake in this, if you wanna seek the Lord through communion, you can go grab those things whenever you're comfortable. Well, we're gonna be joining together with the worship team. So let's worship together. I lift up my head, I sing out a song, I'll fix my eyes on Jesus till the things of this earth all pass away. my eyes on Jesus, oh my soul, if you are weary, if there's no light in the darkness you see, there is light. Look at the Savior, you'll find the light more abundant and free. I lift up my head, I sing out a song, I'll fix my eyes on Jesus. leads on now we follow him there I lift up my head I sing out a song I lift my eyes on Jesus still the things of this earth It's holy, holy, I will shine in light, behold his glory, come face to face with the Lord of hosts, I will join the song 
of thousands and thousands holy 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 Lord. I lift up my my eyes on Jesus still the things of this earth all pass away I'll fix my eyes on Jesus I'll fix my eyes Heartland, welcome to the first service of 2021. We're glad that you've decided to spend part of your weekend with us. Let's continue to worship together. One, two, three, four. My heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others fall, you are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing and the pain, through it all, you never fail me. You are the strength. You are the strength of my heart I can rely on you I can rely on you When I've struggled to believe You have not let go of me God my rock, God my rock, God my rock Carry through the darkest storms You have held me in your arms God my rock, God my rock God, my rock in the blessing of the pain. Through it all, you never fail me. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. You are the joy of my life You are my song in the night There is no one as true Jesus, I trust in you Trust in you, Jesus, we 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 trust in you, Jesus, we
Jesus, we trust in you.
Happy New Year. Welcome to Heartland. You're the first guests we've had here in 2021, and I'm really glad to be together with you today. I don't know how you personally feel, but I am so glad to have 2020 behind us. From everything COVID to abbreviated hockey playoffs, from widespread financial struggles to the divisive American election, from racial tension to a canceled CFL season, this past year has not been my favorite. And to top it all off, a Christmas without travel and extended family has had many people saying, bah humbug. It has been a year to remember and a year many will want to forget. But without a doubt, the number one thing that 2020 will always be remembered for is the worldwide impact that COVID-19 has had. Governments the world over have tried to find ways to slow or stop the spread of this virus, employing a full range of tactics from doing virtually nothing at all to shutting down entire countries for weeks on end. One of the core questions I've heard asked a number of times over the past year is this question, is this worth it? Is shutting down businesses, homes, and schools worth it? Is the mental and emotional challenge of isolating people worth it? Is the hundreds of billions of dollars of debt we are incurring to prop up individuals and businesses really worth it? Or on the other side, is being able to hang out and socialize however I want worth it? Is the lack of action by governments or the lack of obedience to restrictions by individuals or businesses really worth it? Now maybe you haven't been asking this question about COVID, but I would guess that there are places and times in your life when you have asked the question, is this worth it? Perhaps you've spent multiple years and multiple thousands of dollars to get a post-secondary degree only to end up working at a job that has nothing to do with your education. Or you've put a ton of energy and time into your job only to see the promotion given to someone else or outside forces causing you to lose money rather than to make it. It might have been in the context of a difficult marriage or significant relationship that seems like more work than joy. Or you've changed your eating habits and started an exercise program, but there's been little to no evident physical improvement. The list goes on and on. There are many areas and times of my life where I found myself asking the question, is this really worth it? Funny thing though, the worth it question can go the other way too. While it hasn't been often, there have been a couple of times when I've thought the question, am I worth it? Am I worthy of what I'm receiving here in this relationship, this job, this community? I've also been in senior enough positions in some previous roles to be part of discussions about whether a particular individual was worth what our organization was paying them. And I've even had to have some of those tough conversations with someone about whether or not they were living up to the expectations that we had for them in their specific role. Interestingly enough, the Bible also speaks to this question of whether my life and my effort is really worth it. One of the places we find this is in the book of Ephesians, which is a letter written almost 2,000 years ago by a guy named Paul to people who were part of the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was located in the area of the world we know today as the country of Turkey. We're taking a closer look at this letter this year, and today we'll be looking at the first two verses in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. So if you have a Bible with you, or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, why don't you look up Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, I'm going to read these verses from a version of the Bible called the New Living Translation. And I invite you to follow along in whatever version you may be reading from. Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2. Ready? Here we go. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Before Paul makes the statement about living a life that is worth it, he starts with the words, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. 
Most historical and widely respected biblical scholars teach that this letter was written by Paul during his imprisonment in Rome, probably around 60 to 62 AD. Paul had been imprisoned because of accusations by the Jewish leaders that he was inciting riots and dishonoring the Jewish law and temple, all of which were false accusations, but God used these false charges to open the way for Paul to preach and teach in Rome, which was the central city of all the Roman Empire at that time. So Paul is in prison under house arrest, awaiting trial before Caesar, during which time he continues to preach in person to those who are there in Rome and will come to hear him. And he writes a number of letters to churches and Christ followers he knows from areas traveled during his missionary journeys. And that's how this letter to the church in Ephesus came to be. One more small point about his opening words. Paul starts this section with the word, therefore. In doing so, he connects everything he has written in the first half of the letter, what we now call the first three chapters of Ephesians, to where he is now taking the focus of his letter. And those first three chapters are full of incredible truth about who God is, what he has done for us, and who we now have the opportunity to be because of what God has done for us. If you've been following along with us in our series, you're already aware of this significant teaching by Paul. But if you haven't been tracking with us so far, I invite you to go back and view the previous sermons in this series. They begin on September 12th with Pastor Al, and you can find all of the sermons on our website under the media tab in the Ephesians playlist. Paul says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. So based on the powerful truths found in the first half of his letter and inspired by the deepest of conviction about these truths, so much so that he's willing to surrender his very life in order to teach them wherever he can, Paul now begs us to live our lives worthy of our calling. What are you called to? What does Paul mean by your calling? Well, I believe there are multiple ways you can read and apply this phrase to yourself. First, there's the natural, physical, day-to-day -day way to see your calling. Simply put, what is your everyday life all about? This includes your job, your role in significant relationships like marriage, family, family line, your extra extracurricular commitments like volunteering, political involvement, sports, and hobbies, the responsibilities and commitments of everyday life. But you could also say that your calling includes your destiny or your opportunities or your dreams. What do you dream about doing? What big impact are you making or have you always wanted to make on the world around you? Maybe your big life dream is to be a wise and caring parent to your kids or a phenomenal partner to your spouse. Maybe it is to make the life of others better by how you do your job, by the kind of career you choose, or by donating your time to great organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters or Habitat for Humanity. Maybe it is even to be part of drilling wells in drought-stricken countries or to taking part in cutting-edge research to eliminate diseases, or running for political office in order to help make the lives of those you represent better. There is no right or wrong big dream. There's no standard that you must achieve. Only you can really answer the question, where and how can I make a significant impact in life? So if you view your calling in terms of either your everyday life responsibilities or in terms of your big life dream for making an impact and maybe even both ways, then how do you answer Paul when he begs you to lead a life worthy of your calling? Or we could state it another way. The question, are you living up to that calling? If we think of calling in terms of everyday life, it carries with it responsibilities and expectations. Some are there because you choose them, some because others place them on you. 
Seeing yourself as worthy of your calling requires some clear and sometimes tough self-evaluation. When I think of my calling in terms of being a husband to Deborah and a father to John and Rachel, those roles carry both privilege and responsibility. I am so blessed to be married to my best friend. But if I'm brutally honest, there are probably way too many days that I don't give as much as I get. There have likely been far too many occasions where I have not lived worthy of my calling as a husband to Deb. In fact, I've often thought that I don't deserve the amazing wife that I have, and it motivates me to want to do better, to want to support her, care for her, spoil her, be faithful to her, serve her, all because she is such a blessing to me. Same with being a father. I constantly want to be a better dad to my great kids, to live worthy of the honor it is to be looked up to as their father. Well, we can follow this same line of thinking with any part of our life. In my job, do I have the integrity, the work ethic, and the commitment that should be part of the privilege and responsibility of being a pastor in my church? Are you the kind of employee that every owner or manager wishes for or the kind of owner or manager that every employee wishes for? What about where we live? Am I a neighbor that earns the respect and appreciation of those who live around me? Are you someone who your neighbors can trust, depend on, and be thankful for? Now how about your big life dreams? It's one thing for me to live up to the calling of my everyday life commitments, but it's entirely another thing to say that I'm living up to a big dream calling on my life. I can certainly recall a number of times in my life that I thought that is a significant need that I could certainly help meet, only to have the crazy demands of everyday life squash that thought before I began doing anything about it. And the older I get, the more I find myself wondering if I'm going to reach the end of my life with any regrets for not pursuing a bigger dream at some point. Now some might ask, why does it matter if I'm living worthy of my calling or not? Well, there are both negative and positive reasons why it matters. In our physical day-to-day -day lives, the, the why question is often answered in the negative by consequences if we don't live up to expectations. For example, in school, it can result in falling grade, failing grades or having to redo assignments. In relationships, not living worthy can result in heartache, brokenness, and sometimes even animosity or conflict. In my vocation, consequences can include disappointment, distrust, demotion, or even unemployment. In every area of life, not living worthy of our calling will usually carry results that we don't want and don't enjoy. But I'm personally way more motivated by positive reasons than the negative ones. Why does it matter if I'm living worthy of my calling or not? Because when I am living worthy, when I am stretching to be the best husband, father, employee, neighbor, friend, you name it, I'm making the lives of everyone around me better in some way. And that brings a joy and a fulfillment that makes life worthwhile. When I'm striving to accomplish some bigger dream, I'm enthused and alive, and I'm not focused on all the typical ways that life can bring us down. It feels good to make others feel better. And it reminds me that there is more to life than just plodding through the same routine day in and day out. It helps me to see the glass half full instead of half empty. And that is a life-giving reason to live worthy of my calling, whatever that calling may be. So you have a calling on your life and an opportunity, a challenge, to live life worthy of that calling how do we practically do that? Paul gives some very tangible ways to start in the second verse for today when he says these words. 
Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humility. If there is a better way to begin living more worthy of my calling in any part of life, I'm not sure what it is. Putting others first, viewing them as more important than yourself, treating them with the respect that comes from a humble heart. These attitudes and actions are endearing to people in your life, and they earn the respect and appreciation of others. Arrogance and pride are not something we naturally want to be around. But genuine humility, it's like a fragrance we can never get enough of. Gentleness, whereas aggression and harshness in people causes my fight or flight responses to kick in, gentleness causes me to feel cared for, valued, safe, and welcomed. 20 years ago, I changed vocations for a brief period of time and became an insurance and investment advisor for a major financial company. The branch office that I worked in had two assistant managers that I reported to. One was a positive, gentle, and encouraging lady who inspired me to do my best. The other was a critical, harsh, and pushy man who made me feel like I was nothing more than a rock in his shoe every day. All he ever did was step on me, and all I obviously ever did was cause him pain. Can you guess which one I gravitated towards? And which one I avoided at all costs? Patience. How do you do in that department? Me? God is certainly teaching me about this, but man, I sure wish he would do it a lot faster. When I stop to consider how patient God is with me in my life, it really shouldn't be that difficult for me to be patient with others and to make allowance for their faults, should it? As Paul wisely points out, my patience with others, or lack of it, is probably a good barometer of my love for them. And living worthy of my calling in any capacity is certainly going to be easier when I love others than when I don't. These three character qualities, humility, gentleness, and patience, are hugely important if I want to live worthy of every type of calling in my everyday life. As a son, a husband, a father, an employee and co-worker, as a friend, neighbor, coach and volunteer. And these qualities certainly don't hurt me if I'm trying to live towards a greater dream or purpose either. In fact, they are key building blocks to achieving grander goals and making a significant impact in the world we live in. As I was preparing for this talk, I came across the story of Hilda Back, a preschool teacher from Sweden who exemplifies this idea of living up to our calling. In the 1970s, Hilda wanted to give back to the world in some bigger dream way. But she wasn't the gregarious, dynamic, world changer type of personality that we often think is needed to have a big impact. This humble, gentle, and patient woman simply decided one day that she could and would pay for the secondary education of a poor schoolboy in Kenya. Due to her simple, selfless act of kindness, Chris Maburu was able to not only complete his secondary education, but carried on to achieve multiple university degrees and eventually found himself serving as a United Nations human rights advocate. Chris then founded a charitable organization to help other poor Kenyan children pay for their schooling as well, which he named after the school teacher who had helped him. And to date, the Hilda Back Found Education Fund has awarded over 835 scholarships to boys and girls from across Kenya, enabling them to access secondary school and post-secondary school education. Hilda Back realized that part of her calling in life was to make an impact in the lives of others, somehow, some way. And living worthy of her calling included sponsoring the education for a complete stranger in another country, but it also included 
making an everyday difference in the lives of children as a school teacher herself, investing in them with humility, gentleness, and patience. What about you? How would you say you are doing in living out these powerful character qualities? What does living up to your calling look like in your everyday life? And what bigger dream are you pursuing? Back at the beginning of this message, I said that there were multiple ways to read and apply the concept of calling to our lives. Paul started these verses with the word therefore, which connected these verses to everything that he had written to that point. And in doing so, he unlocked a deeper and even more significant meaning of this idea of calling. It is a spiritual meaning, and in simplest terms, it refers in part to the invitation God gives us to live in restored, intimate friendship with him as an adopted daughter or son in his family. There are a number of places in the first chapter of this letter where Paul talks about this calling. And he uses words like, even before he made the world, God loved us. And he goes on to say, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family, his own family. As one who reads, studies, believes in, and tries to live according to God's written word to us, the Bible, I understand it to teach that God has an incredible plan for my life. And he's invited me to willingly enter into that plan and partner with him in fulfilling it. That plan started with what he did for me in sending Jesus, his son, to this earth as a human baby. We celebrated at Christmas time. And that baby grew into a man who was without fault or evil or sin in any way and who died on a cross to pay the ultimate price for my faults, evil, and sin in order that I could be part of God's perfect, holy family and plan. And to partner with him in that plan, I need to believe that Jesus did this for me, that he came to save me from my sin, and I need to follow him in every way. In effect, surrendering my life to his leading making him the Lord of my life. And this is the deepest meaning of this idea of calling. That God has rescued me from a life of sin and evil and given me citizenship in his kingdom and a place in his family, not only for this earthly life, but forever in the life that follows after it. I, Greg Mulligan, am called to a restored and amazing personal relationship with Almighty God, the one who created life and who gives it purpose and fulfillment. Now that's a calling. And it's the greatest calling of all. So then the question of whether I am worthy of my calling takes on an even greater significance when I look through this lens of spiritual calling when I consider the incredible price that Jesus paid in order to give me the opportunity to be part of God's grander vision? Am I honoring God with my thoughts, my choices, my actions? Or am I indifferent and apathetic with my life? Am I living worthy of the incredible gift he has given me through Jesus? Am I doing what I can do to significantly improve the lives of those around me and the lives of others around the world, just like Jesus did what he could do to significantly improve my life. And when I begin to see my calling and my fulfillment of that calling from this spiritual viewpoint, it helps me understand Paul's key phrase in this whole issue when he writes, For you have been called by God. You see, the responsibilities of your everyday life are even more important than they were before because you have been called by God. The impact you can make through a bigger dream 
is even more significant than it was before because you have been called by God. And your life can have the meaning and fulfillment that you have been searching for because you have been called by God. We should want to live life worthy of the calling we have received because we have been called by God who loves us more than we can truly fathom and who has plans for us that we can't even fully dream of on our own. We should desire that intimate connection with him and that deep connection with others in his family because of the gift God has given us in calling us to be part of it. If what I've just described has sparked something here for you, it sparked it right here. If you want to experience more than just the day-to-day calling of vocation and responsibilities and struggles and live for something grander and more fulfilling than anything you've ever known, you can take the first step in that journey right here, right now. All you do is tell God what you want to believe and want to do. And it can be as simple a prayer as this. God, I don't want to want to live for only myself and what I think is important. I want to believe that Jesus died for me to make the way for me to become part of your family and live for your bigger vision for my life. I choose to believe and to follow Jesus. Amen. If, as I spoke those words, you spoke them from your heart to God, then he heard you. And the Bible says that now all of heaven is celebrating big time. I would be thrilled to help you begin to understand what has changed in your life and what life can begin to look like from this point on. Give me a call sometime. I'd love to talk. What is your calling Are you living a life worthy of the calling you have received? Humility, gentleness, and patience, they can be key pieces of living this way. And it matters. It is really worth it because you have been called by God. In a few moments, I'm going to lead us through what the Bible calls the Lord's Supper, where we eat a piece of bread and drink the juice in a symbolic remembering of the price Jesus paid for your sin and mine. It is through his sacrifice on the cross for you and for me that we have been called by God. And it is because of him that you and I can live a life worthy of that calling. The team is going to sing a song before we eat and drink. And I encourage you to focus on the words of that song as they do. But before they sing, I want to pray for you. God, thank you for each person who is listening to this today. Thank you that you love them so much. You are willing to give Jesus in our place to pay the penalty that we rightly deserved. And thank you that because of what Jesus did, each one of us has an opportunity to live life worthy of that price. We have an opportunity to raise the bar in many ways in our life. God, I pray that each person listening today would want to do that, would make a choice today to start living for something bigger, living more fulfilling, living because they were called by you. Bless them, I pray. Amen. If ever I should lose my way, remind me of the price you paid. Remind me you're not finished yet.
Hallelujah. I live in remembrance. What great words to that song. Remembering what someone like Hilda Back has done in changing the life of a young Kenyan boy, that certainly inspires me to want to do more for others. But remembering what Jesus has done, the price he paid to free me from the penalty for my sin and restore me to an amazing relationship with Almighty God, that overwhelms me with gratitude and compels me to live a life worthy of this calling I have received from God. Jesus himself created this symbol of remembrance as he ate the Last Supper with his followers just before he was arrested and then crucified. As they sat around the table, Jesus took a loaf of bread. He broke it. He gave thanks to God. And then he said these words, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks. God, thank you for being willing to send Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to suffer for us when you didn't deserve it and we did. And thank you for creating this symbol that we can remember the price you paid. We can give our thanks to you and dedicate our lives to living more worthy of what you did for us. We bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat the bread together in remembrance. Then after they had eaten the supper together, Jesus took a cup filled with wine and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so Lord Jesus, we say thank you for shedding your blood to pay the penalty that was rightly ours. And thank you that by that shed blood, our slate has been wiped clean. That we have a fresh start. A new relationship. Because of what you have done for us. We thank you. We give you praise. And we remember you as we do this together. Amen. Let's drink together in remembrance. The Apostle Paul tells us in another of his letters that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup of remembrance, we proclaim Jesus' death and resurrection and we do so until he comes again. And when he comes again, I so want to be able to stand before him knowing I have lived my life worthy of the price he paid to save it. Thanks for being with us today. We always close our services by speaking a blessing from Scripture. And I encourage you, if you want to receive that blessing, to simply hold your hands out as if to say, Yes, Lord, I want everything you have for me. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and a wonderful hope, May he encourage you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Have a safe and happy new year. And may 2021 be a year of living worthy of the calling you have received. God bless you. I take the bread of for all my sin your body crucified to make me whole again I will recall the cup poured out in 
Thanks for tuning in, guys. I really hope that the Holy Spirit highlighted something specific for you throughout this service. If you have any questions about anything we did throughout this service, anything we said, or you just want to connect with us, we would love to connect with you. You can call the church office. We don't bite. Or, or you could pop us an email. Uh, we would love to connect with you that way as well. Other than that, guys, have a great week. God bless. <laughs>